Okay, great. I would like to welcome everyone to the meeting tonight. And um, we'll start with our land acknowledgement. Simcoe County District School Board acknowledges that we are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodawatomi nations collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Okay, we'll just go over our um, pick mandate again. Um, so it's to support, encourage, and enhance parent engagement at the board level and to improve student achievement and well-being. Um, provide information and advice to the board on parent engagement. Communicate with and to support school um, board support school councils. Undertake activities to help parents support their children's learning at home and at school. And at this time, I'm looking for a motion that the agenda be approved as printed. I see a hand, sorry. Um, Andrea, um, thank you for your motion to approve. Um, I need somebody to second. I'll second. Great, Sarah. Sarah. Um, so the motion to approve the agenda has been carried. Um, and then our next um, item is guest speakers. So I would like to introduce Louise Pike and Valerie Gray, a well-being facilitators. Um, Louise and Valerie are elementary school educator, educators, and um, they provide support to Simcoe County District School Board, priority schools for student mental health and well-being. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for um, including us in your um, evening tonight. Uh, I think I have share screen access here, and I'm just gonna share my screen um, to walk through our presentation. I'm excited to be involved in this. Um, I was able to join my own child's parent council this year. He started kindergarten this year, so um, I can appreciate the work that you do, and thank you again. All right, just a thumbs up. Hopefully everybody can see what I can see. Um, so as mentioned, awesome, we are elementary educators and we are working this year to support student mental health and well-being. I just wanted to start by highlighting that well-being continues to be a strategic priority. Um, and we're really excited this year that our department has grown to add some educator voices. The mental health and well-being department has um, social work, CYW and attendance counselors. And this year has added educator voice as well. And Val, are you there? I am here, thank mm -hmm. you. So um, as we get started, um, it's really important to mention that mental health and well-being are not. They are not outside of education. Um, they are not in competition with academic achievement. Um, they're not a program or a few classroom strategies. They are not only, um, they're not for students um, who are only showing obvious signs of struggles. And they are not separate from our work in equity, social justice, engagement, and diversity. Uh, mental health and well-being is everything that we do every day. Yeah, so we wanted to start just with a little bit of shared learning. Um, this might be affirming for some um, or new learning for others, but um, I think it's important that we have um, sort of a shared understanding of mental health. So what is mental health? Well, often when we think about mental health, our minds turn to images like this one of people who are struggling with difficult thoughts or emotions. We might think about students with depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, attentional problems. Um, but that is not mental health. That is something closer to um, mental illness. So really, uh, mental health looks something, something more like this. It's a positive state of flourishing and balance. And mental health is something that we all want to need and something that we need to pay attention to and nurture, just like we do for our physical health. And School Mental Health Ontario gives us um, really great visual um, that we can see as a range or a spectrum. Sometimes it's helpful to think about mental health as a continuum. It's actually a dual continuum. All of us find ourselves somewhere along this continuum and our experiences of things or wellness or illness can change over time depending on a number of things. So the dual continuum of mental health shows that uh, mental health and mental illness are actually two separate 
but intersecting ideas. Um, and when we can understand mental health and men mental illness on this dual continuum, we can recognize where we might be and use strategies to help or support us. Um, and there's some really great learning um, that, that we're doing in schools with work around this to get educators and students to understand the dual continuum. Um, awesome. Um, so here is just a, a survey was completed in 2000, in 2021 by School Mental Health Ontario. And this is one of the um, findings that came out of that, one of the student recommendations. Students really articulated that they want culturally responsive resources for their parents and caregivers and their family members about mental health. Um, they want their teachers, parents, caregivers, and families to feel more confident and comfortable in talking about mental health. So um, in schools, we are um, teaching social emotional learning skills and your child also learns the skills from you and other adults at home. Um, and we teach them with purpose too. And we are working on um, how to manage stress, identify our emotions as um, comfortable or uncomfortable emotions within our bodies, um, staying positive and keep moving forward um, to build um, resilience, nurturing um, important relationships, know and feel good about ourselves and plan and problem solve. So there's some activities that um, are really great that we can use at home and I will go through um, some of them. So strategies that parents can work on. Um, I'm not sure it's linked. We're not did it pop that. up or did it not it pop up? It didn't pop up. No, I think you have to share a different screen. screen. Sorry, everybody. So, um, that's okay. <laughs> So one of the strategies is deep belly breathing. So practicing breathing and recognizing the sensations in your body as you breathe. Um, Sorry, Val, I'll just interrupt you for a moment. So the yep. activities to try at home that Val is talking about are from School Mental Health Ontario. Um, and it's just not letting me share that part of my screen. It didn't pop up. But all of this is linked in the slide deck, which we did share with Kim. Do you want to speak to one more, Val? And then Yeah, um, sure. So just... Um, uh, one an another great one is just gratitude moments, um, making time to share things that we're thankful for. Another one, another strategy really is, um, you know, four finger affirmations, um, helping students um, persevere through tough moments. I can do this, things like that. And they're great visuals that um, easily go home, but um, can can be done once a week or um, just reminders to make some connection time with with our families and students. Thanks, Val. Um, so just building on what Val said, monthly strategies is something that we have been pushing out to um, the system, to educators, but you may have also seen this showing up in the parent newsletters. Um, so we have a strategy of the month, which comes from School Mental Health Ontario. They're all coping strategies related to social emotional learning. Um, so for the month of May, we've been focused on four finger affirmations and in June, we'll be moving into gratitude moments. So Again, that information goes out to educators to help them support in the class. And then we paired that with um, in the school newsletters. So we should be seeing that come home to families as well. And our last slide here is some more links. So we mentioned School Mental Health Ontario a number of times. That is where we get the bulk of our resources. It is evidence-based. It is educators working with clinicians um, to create resources to support um, educators, system leaders, as well as families. Um, so I don't know if I click on this link, if it will, you will follow me and see what I can see. No. <laughs> oh, darn. That's okay. Because um, what I've done there is just to collate um, where some of the um, kind of heavy hitters, the ones that people are most often looking for. So the first link takes you to the homepage for parents and caregivers. And there's um, a, a video series called By Your Side which is just three um, videos giving parents some information on how to access services, um, talking about transitions between you know, entering into school and that transition into secondary school. The Noticing Mental Health Concerns for Your Child um, has, again, some great supports on how to um, support within the school as well as in the community. The With Care is a tip sheet for parents and caregivers for having some of those difficult, difficult conversations. And the last one, Helping Your Child Manage Digital Technology, has been um, a popular one as well. So um, that's it for our presentation. The, um, the links are all in there. So um, Kim, sorry, we got it to you a little bit late, but if that can go out to the rest of uh, your council there, we look forward to uh, connecting with you guys again.
if you have any questions, we're here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Are there any questions from the committee at this time? Uh, yes, hello, how are you? Uh, this is Maria. I have a question. Um, that it say here that the program on May is uh, finger affirmations, but what kind of program is that or what includes? Because that sounds very interesting. Yeah, so four finger affirmations is a strategy of the month and it is just attaching um, a word that helps you to feel calm and confident to each of your four fingers. So I actually did it with students today and some of their words were things like brave, strong, kind, um, honest. So, and then they repeat those words to themselves. And we teach students to do this, not only in times when they are feeling stressed or uncomfortable emotions, but how can they build this into their regular routine? So I asked them, so what is something that you do every single day? Oh, I brush my teeth. Awesome. Can you say a four finger affirmation to yourself when you brush your teeth so that that starts to become a habit for you? So um, it will be in the May, it would have been in the May newsletter, um, some tips for parents. And it, again, it goes out to educators too. Thank you for your question. That's pretty good. Thank you. We have any other questions? Mike uh, has I his hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. That's okay. Um, you said that it there was a lot of stuff that was going out to parents. Are the teachers and educators themselves all being taught like a uniformed way to bring this SEL program to each kids? And does it move up with each grade as it goes through or is it just per like for each grade type thing um i'll answer that as best i can but i also write some notes down to speak to our school ment our mental health lead as well um so it's not a program um because the strategies it's kind of k to eight and then there's also a series of sel posters for secondary students but the strategies are the same so four finger affirmations we can do in kindergarten and we can do in secondary school in terms of support for educators, it goes out in, um, we have weekly student achievement emails. So they get the, um, the strategy as well as curriculum connections um, and, offer, and ways to integrate it into their regular class. Um, there's also a mental health literacy course for educators, which is offered by School Mental Health Ontario. So that is some of the work that we're doing. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. We'll just take a look around. I don't see any other hands up. Um, so at this time, we'd like to move on to our next uh, guest speaker. I would like to introduce Kim Malkameki. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, Chief Executive Officer and General Manager for the Simcoe County Student Transportation Consortium. Kim has been with the consortium since 2014 and has been involved in all facets of the organization. Kim is also a proud mom of two boys in grades eight and five who attend the Simcoe County District School Board um, and has also been involved with parent council at their school and appreciates all the hard work and dedication that goes into these committees. Kim? Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me today. Um, so I will just uh, just take one second here to share my screen. Um, and that should. Oops. Sorry, my mouse is all over the place here. Too many screens open. Did that pop up okay? Yep, it's fine. Perfect. That's great. Okay, thank you. So, um, so just to start, really. So, who we are? Um, we are a um, separate legal entity. We were formed in 2011, really by joining the two transportation departments of the two school boards here in Simcoe County. So of course the Simcoe County District School Board and the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board. Um, so really in our office, we are a staff of 10 and we uh, plan the transportation for all um, students who are transported in Simcoe County. So that's actually over 38,000 students um, across, um, you know, ranging in areas from all the way down in Bradford, all the way up to Midland and Aurelia. And actually for um, our the coterminous board, um, it actually does go all the way up to um, Muskoka and Perry Sound. Um, so we have uh, just over 700 vehicles, really, that um, that transport those students to 155 uh, public and Catholic schools in the county. 
So kilometers, about 63,000 kilometers uh, per day. So that's, you know, just a fun little fact that it's about 1.6 times around uh, the equator every every single day. Um, you know, uh, Simcoe County is quite a, quite a vast area and it's just close to 4,900 square kilometers. Um, so again, we, we are all over the place all every day. Uh, so three pillars of our of our strategic priorities here that we like to focus on. Um, so really student safety, uh, customer service and a sustainable service model. And we do that um, through providing uh, various services to schools and students. Um, so some of those I'll go into greater detail here, but we've got so home to school transportation, of course, is our, you know, our main um, bread and butter of our organization, um, providing access to transportation information for for families and schools. Um, transportation policy, policy and issue support, uh, student safety, and then of course we assist with uh, charter and field trip bookings with schools. So for home to school transportation scheduling, really, um, you know, the, the school is the keeper of all that information. So, you know, any, any address changes, any changes really to anything related to student data or information is, is really um, kept at the school level and that, um, you know, through our automatic processes, those that information is then transferred to us. And then we are then able to go through and, um, you know, assign the routing and things like that for, for the students that would be um, impacted by transportation. So, um, so again, any requests that, that ever come up, they all really stem from the school. They're sent to our office here for review and then really sent back to the school as they are the ones that have the relationships and they communicate with the families on our behalf. Oops, sorry. So transportation information. Um, so really on our website here is, you know, a variety of information. So, um, you know, bus delays, notifications, um, cancellation information, you know, information about policies and some FAQs. And, you know, um, we came up with a couple of years ago, it was more how do I. So if parents were ever looking for, you know, very specific um, information on what, you know, what things they can do and, and how to how to go about that. That's all on our website. Um, of course, school bus safety information, we post monthly safety tips there, um, things like that. So our website is a great, uh, great tool for, for information. Um, policy and issue support. So really, um, you know, again, the boards have their own their own policies, again, relating to their walk zones and things like that and, and bus stop locations and, and ride times. So really, we um, provide transportation services in keeping with with those board policies. Um, so sometimes, you know, um, students might request transportation. Um, and so we would support, um, you know, any uh, any support, uh, you know, transportation appeals or any um, reviewing of, of either walk zones or bus stop locations, things like that. Um, we attend school locations, you know, if there are safety concerns with the school load zones and, you know, if there's parent vehicle, you know, flow, traffic, things like that, we would, um, we would attend and provide support, um, you know, to schools in those regards. And then, of course, you know, while on the bus, um, you know, we would be sort of the intermediary helping with any bus driver concerns or any of those incidents that are taking place on the bus um, that would require, you know, any investigation and things like that, that would be brought to our attention. And then we would work with the school um, on that, those issues um, to resolve that. So student safety, so just um, some of the safety programs here. So um, our first rider program, of course, is the one where, um, you know, students that are new to transportation in kindergarten or really any grade, um, they are able to attend. There's a little video, you know, some um, information session, and then there's actually a short little trip um, on a bus. So um, we, we have that schedule posted now. So we will have in-person programs running through August. And so those are free to attend and there's no sign up required and really just depending on your area of attendance, um, students and families are, are free to attend any of those sessions that they choose. Uh, bus tag program is for, again, students that are in JK and SK or grades one to four in the French immersion programs or any other students that really are identified that need to be met. Um, so we create a like a colored bus tag that matches a bus route and that way it just sort of indicates a couple of things. So it helps the school staff to help load the students onto the correct vehicle. They can match the blue tag with the blue bus at, at their school. Um, so there's only one colored bus at, at each school. And it, at the end of the day, it actually helps the bus drivers identify that any student with that bus tag must be met by a parent or guardian. So it's just, again, another flag as that student's getting off that they can check for that bus tag and making sure that there's an adult there waiting at the bottom of the steps for, for that parent. 
Um, so evacuation training is, so it takes place two times per year. Um, and this happens right at the school, uh, just after the morning runs. So the bus drivers would actually just sort of run through what to do in an emergency situation, um, how to evacuate from the front door, the back door, side doors, you know, things to do, things to keep in mind, and that always that they're taking the direction from the drivers in those situations. Uh, so operator assessments. So this takes place really in our office and we um, we actually visit operator locations two times per year. So we actually do, you know, audit their, um, you know, their safety and, and all of their records and things like that. So again, just making sure that they're in compliance with, you know, any le uh, regulated legislation, um, you know, changes like that. So again, we're just making sure that, um, you know, that things are the way that they're supposed to be. And then as I had dis discussed before, load zone reviews. So that takes place at schools. Just again, sometimes depending on, you know, many schools have many buses. So, you know, it's just trying to make sure that the vehicles are in the right place and that, you know, there's safe movement of, of student traffic and things like that around, um, you know, those vehicles and students that would be walking out um, to parent vehicles or to the school vehicles as well. So here's a super fun topic, snow days. We, you know, again, we I, we like to kind of uh, break it out as a separate topic, just because there is a lot that goes into it. So, um, so really, um, you know, who makes the decision? It, it's the bus operators. They, we are part of the decision, but it is, um, it is their ultimate decision. They are the ones that have the assets. It's their drivers on the road. So we're there to support the decision. We are the ones who communicate it. Um, but again, it is a, it is their decision, and we are, we are there to, um, to be involved and to support. So the information used. So really. A lot of information goes into it. So the process really does start about, you know, noon, early afternoon, the day before, you know, we would start looking at um, what we're seeing for weather coming in either that night, the next morning, things like that. And so actually in the morning, what happens is that there's, um, so there's snow captains that would get on the actual conference call to make the decision, but they actually reach out to many different staff. So there could really be any number of you know, between 50 to 100 people that are providing input into those snow days. And these are local drivers, these are safety trainers, these are managers who are out driving routes between, you know, say three and five o'clock every morning. And then we would get on the conference call at 530. And that decision is made at 530 in the morning, um, because we do have some runs that start as early as six to 630. So that's, that's why the timing is, um, is as early as it is just so that we can get that information out to parents and families as soon as possible. So that speaks to the when, and then so where is the information available? So, um, so I'm sure a number of you have probably seen it. We post on our website, we post to Twitter, and we actually just a couple of years ago um, came out with a, there's an app that's Bus Planners app. So we post a general notification. So if you've um, subscribed through that app, then you would get a push notification through to your phone, just saying that you know the North Zone is canceled today, and, and that would show up right to your phone. So you would have that information um, as soon as it's posted. And so again, best efforts are always made to post those between 6 and 6.30, just again, the timing um, of the vehicles. And the last one here is, so our charter and our field trip booking. So, um, so this is some um, a support that the SCSTC provides to schools. Um, so there's an online portal system that schools would go in, they would make their request, um, and then the trip details are reviewed, and then it's pushed out to bid to all of the local um, operators. Um, so they would then be allowed to put in their pricing, you know, we would confirm details. Um, and then again, it, we would just assign it based on, you know, based on the bids, based on the pricing, the timing, um, you know, to, to provide the best service for, um, for the request for that trip. So that about sums up the services that, uh, that we provide. So uh, I can turn it over for any questions. And actually, sorry, I'll stop sharing my screen just so that I can see better. Thank you, Kim, for your presentation. I'm going to turn it over um, to the group members. Are there any questions for Kim? Uh, Mike, I see your hand up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just had a question. We, I know a couple of schools in our area have had to defer field trips because of bus availability. I was just wondering what, if anything, uh, you guys are doing to either retain employees or hire new ones to get more buses available. Right. So, so the bus drivers, they work for the operating company, so they don't actually work for us. So we would contract those, those operators through contracts that we, that we hold for the school boards. Um, so again, best efforts are made to, to secure drivers. They are, they're constantly recruiting. Um, it's, a, it's a tough climate to, to secure um, drivers. And again, 
Uh, the, the main, again, operators are obligated under the contract, so they must first provide their home to school transportation services and make sure that the students are able to get to and from school before they are then able to, um, to provide a vehicle for charters. So um, we have seen great improvements through throughout the year, but what we do is we offer schools different time changes. Say, for example, if they wanted to leave at eight o'clock in the morning, but, you know, again, between seven and nine is when we would have 100% of our bus buses on the road for home to school. So then we would just ask that if they could accommodate a different time so that it would secure, it would help secure that vehicle. Another option that we offer is bus sharing. So where, you know, two schools might be going down to the same place and, you know, and they're in the same area. Well, we would look at the numbers and see if there was an opportunity to, to share that asset. So that way we were only require one vehicle and that it would have a better chance of securing that field trip. Great, thank you, Kim. Trustee Grummet. Okay, hi. Um, hello. First of all, uh, Kim, I wanted to uh, thank you for that report and that presentation. And um, as a new trustee, I have learned so much about transportation. Um, it is a very popular topic. Uh, and there's also lots of issues, I understand. And I appreciate Superintendent Sidlowski is also a wonderful support. Um, but a uh, big job. And just thank you for you know, doing the job you do, because it is really tough. And when you gave that number, 63,000 kilometers a day, like, wow. So um, just a friendly reminder that it is tough and you are doing the best you can, because I think there's there's a lot of negativity around transportation, but I appreciate uh, the work you're doing and I, I'm grateful for this information. So thank you. Thank you, that's appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Melissa Wilson. Yes, hi, Kim. A uh, quick question for you. Um, concerning the training that's done twice per year for the bus evacuation, is it generally just for staff or is it for staff and the students that's on the bus? Yes, so it would actually be for all of the students that would be on the bus. So it would be, um, they would be educated on what to do in an emergency situation. So it's actually the bus driver that is with them every day that would then conduct that training, basically just walking through again, you know, how to, again, if there's, if there's an emergency situation at the front of the bus, then they would walk through an evacuation at the back, right? Just knowing again, what to do and, and who to take direction from and all of that. So it's just trying to remind students of, again, in those moments, turn to your bus driver so that they can tell you, you know, what to do and, and where to go. Okay, thank you for that. So my follow up question with that. Um, so what happens to the students that's on the bus with all their various abilities, that's in a wheelchair and not able to comprehend that type of information? And how are they generally escorted off the bus um, during the process of an evacuation? Absolutely. So in those cases, again, they do they do verbal discussions with all students, regardless of whether they can evacuate or not. Those vehicles that students are transported for wheelchair vehicles, there's a lot less students. Like when I'm talking on the big buses, you know, there could be anywhere from, you know, 48 to 70 students, right? So um, so those ones are, are the ones that they do like the bigger evacuations for. But again, with the smaller vehicles, the drivers have different training. They're they're trained on, on the needs of the students. So again, in those emergency situations, again, it would turn to the driver and they would be the ones that would be responsible for for taking care of those students and in a case if there um, there are multiple students on the bus with a wheelchair is that driver provided additional support uh, no the driver is there and and again they um they are trained in in those situations again well how to how to evacuate those students and and what to do and things like that again most of the students are um like lots of the students are, are capable of, of getting on and off and, and getting onto the vehicle. Like there's a lift on those vehicles, right? So um, so again, they have lots of training that goes into students and families as well um, in those situations. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Melissa. Sarah, Scott? Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question regarding the transportation for students who so say a student's um, home address is within walking distance, therefore disqualifying them from a bus, but their before and after care is busing distance. And I'm just wondering um, if there's anything that can be done or why that's not taken into consideration for student transportation, especially in rural areas, there's not a lot of options for before and after care. And so it's really limiting to parents when they don't have access to transportation that way. And so why both addresses have to be taken into consideration when the one that's going to be mainly used is busing distance. 
Right. So, so the board's policy actually is that it's it's determined transportation is determined based on the student's primary address as identified by the school. Um, and so whatever is identified by the school as their address, that is what we have to use. Um, and that's basically it goes right back to policy. OK, so. I know of a minimum of six families who have lied and provided forged documentation just to prove that their address is not their actual address, just to be able to access transportation, which doesn't seem very safe. It's not very honest. It's not providing the school board or the schools with accurate information regarding that child's address. And parents are forced to do this because they don't have access to proper care for their children. And so it just doesn't seem like, I understand it's policy, but I also don't see how that benefits children you then have to worry about parents who are leaving children who are too young home alone because they have no other options. And it just doesn't seem like it's something that's a policy that makes a whole lot of sense, especially when we have so many rural schools that can't offer any type of before and after care in the school. And that also has limited availability around the school area. So it's just, it's very challenging because it doesn't seem like it's making safety a priority for the children if parents are being forced into these situations that forces them to lie to the school or forces them to leave their children home alone when they really shouldn't be and things like that. Right. So again, I would, um, you know, I would have to defer to the board. Unfortunately, it's, it's the board's policy that we can only provide transportation based on the information given to us. Um, and I would imagine that there's, again, maybe an, an address verification process or something from the school. So, you know, I, again, I can't speak to the information provided to a school, unfortunately, because as I said, we just get the information as a, a direct, direct file from the school. We don't um, we don't have any involvement in, in providing that information or anything. So, um, you know, what comes through our system is, is all we can provide. And um, and again, basically, we we provide transportation based on policy, which is which is that um, the primary address. And so, who would be in charge of amending or looking into changing that policy to make transportation for children more accessible? So, Sarah, I can definitely answer that. Um, it does come back to the superintendent in charge of transportation, which is myself. And as you were talking about a case by case situation, I would have to connect with the principal of the school and look at the verification of address process and see what we can do with, with respect to that. Okay. Okay. Because I know for a fact, we have one family in our school who has created a fake lease agreement for a fake address and provided it to the school just so that their children have access to before and after care that they use Monday to Friday. So the fact that their home address is close enough to the school to walk, but the fact that they will never ever use their home address for transportation, it just seems unfortunate that parents have to go to the, you know, through the yeah. process of creating fraud just so that their students have that access. So it would be, you know, and our principal can... didn't give it a case by case basis. So, we so can, it was just a flat no. Yeah, we can definitely discuss that and, and have a conversation okay. about that and uh, how we go about verifying address information um, as we move forward. Okay. Great, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Susan. Um, so at this time, um, we'll move on to our next guest speaker. Um, please join me in welcoming Sandy Klee, Assistant Manager of Accommodation Honors um, BES, urban, re urban and rural planning. Is that rural or regional? Um, Sandy Klee graduated as a land use planner with a minor in park planning from the University of Waterloo, Ontario, and has worked at Simcoe County District School Board for 22 years, concentrating on facility planning, capital projects, space allocation, program initiatives, the growth in the country, in the county, and creation of new planning applications have kept have kept the role at the board both challenging and exciting. Sandy is proud recipient of the Toyota Playground Placemaker Award and part of the dynamic team who received the Lake Simcoe Conservative Conservation Authority's Health Community Award and the Nottawasaga Valley um, Conservation Authority. Conservation Partner Award. 
Sandy. Hi, everyone. So I've been asked to comment and provide information on our accommodation plan for this year. I believe I did a presentation a couple of years ago. So I have updated the presentation and share my screen. Hard to see the screen. Susan, can we see it? Yes. Okay. Perfect. That's okay. Just double <laughs> in my head, I was saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my um presentation doesn't show the hyperlinks because I've put it into presentation mode. So I will kind of show you where you can click. And it's basically your control click mouse and it will get you right to the different areas of the accommodation plan because this year uh, we've gone digital with a lot of our data instead of just charts and graphs that are pdfs so hopefully it's a little bit more interactive and you guys can find it um, uh, interesting to look at the data so we do an annual accommodation plan and it's a living document so it's constantly changing we're constantly monitoring development applications, the number of students. So every single student we call, we have in our database, we geocode. So geocode basically means that we um, run it through their address. So kind of funny, I like to know those addresses that are not true. Um, and we put the kids in a on a spot on the road. And so we know exactly where every single student is by grade, by program, um, if there are special education needs, any of those things. So we're using the data from a pure, you know, numbers perspective. And so that's how we, uh, that's why it's a living document because it's constantly changing every year with new developments, new students, new programming. So I've given the hyperlink on this page for the accommodation. So it goes right to the board website because it's kind of difficult to maneuver on our board website to get to the right spot. So if you can control click on the um, title page, it will get you right to the board website. And so this is what it would look like on the board website. So you go to the home page and it's in called about and then at capital plan accommodation plans will drop down and you will see this sort of page and there's hyperlinks for every snot on your um, web but once you get into the board website it will click on each one of these and these are hyperlinks to actual uh, they're called dashboards or story maps that give you information for each of the pieces of the accommodation plan so basically the accommodation plan provides its frameworks for um, decisions that the board must make in terms of balancing enrollment. So this is where in this capital plan, accommodation plan, we would go to the board and say that one school is at its maximum capacity. We can't put any more portables on or we're reaching the number of portables and staff are recommending to the board that we do an attendance boundary. So that is where you'll find attendance boundary reviews uh, required. It, we would have what we'd call people accommodation reviews. So those were when we were looking at um, safe facilities that had to reach a life expectancy or there was um, huge disparities in the enrollment in a, maybe a, a specific area that we were looking at closing a school. Um, right now, the uh, Ministry of Education has a moratorium on people accommodation reviews. So that won't be found in any board's uh, plans across the province. We also look at program reviews. So say a school is maybe oversubscribed with um, French programming. So that's where we would determine at this point whether or not a new program would be added in a community. So this year in Bradford, a new French immersion program started and was split into Harvest Hills and a WH Day. So that's where you would find any of those triggers that would happen. We also show the construction of new schools, uh, any additions, uh, any upgrades to facilities if we're doing major infrastructure work or program work specifically in the secondary panels where we're looking at trying to upgrade, say, hospitality or music or any of those programs and any partnership opportunities. So that would flag to any of our community partners and municipalities to say that we're planning to uh, ask for a new school. And that's where we'd say, is any municipality interested in partnering with us? So that's how the Sega Beach uh, partnership came that we did an oversized gym 
for the school that we're currently working on for Oro Medante, where they're doing a community center with us with an oversized gym. So that's how those kind of partnerships form themselves. And some schools will stay right out that we're not interested in partnerships. And the main, and when, when we talk partnerships, we're talking like capital, like building, um, because maybe our site is too small. So we know if we're going to build a 600 people play school and we only have five acres, um, we just can't afford to invite a partner to it because we just don't have enough room on the site. So here is uh, one of the pages, section one, and it's... It's basically the capital accommodation strategy. So these are all the, the heavy hitters, we'll call it, in the accommodation plan. Like this is the meat of any direction that the board would provide back to planning to implement. So I put a little hyperlink. It looks a little different than it does um, in, the, in the actual accommodation plan. So I had to fake it out so you guys could click on it. So I, oh, actually, this one's coming up. So if you uh, click and right click, it will go right to the story map, which is um, basically. It's actually my favorite app in the accommodation plan. It's a, a celebration of all the capital work that the board has undertaken. So like we're big, Simcoe County is large, and we have a lot of capital projects that we're working on. So when you go into this, you can see the stage of each capital project as it's going through construction or where it sits in our process or the ministry's process for approval. And once it gets to five slides, it starts to do a slideshow. So like for instance, Marshview and Harvest Hills, it's right from the infancy, from the day they started digging, right to the day that the kids were introduced. So it's a nice celebration of where we're at. Um, and it provides, it helps us, because uh, we get a lot of calls. Well, where's Tecumseh Beaton Child Care at? And so you can actually go to it, see that, oh, it's just started construction. And we actually, we got our first pictures today. So they'll be posted in the next couple of days up of the constructions. We try to take pictures every two weeks and see the how the transition is going. How we get these big capital priorities is that um, we wait until the Ministry of Education makes a capital call. That's what it's just called. It is not consistent. It is never at the same time. It's usually politically driven. Um, so the last capital call that we received was a year and a half ago. And we actually didn't get any of the priorities, even though we are the fastest growing area in, in Ontario, uh, we were not given any priorities that go. Uh, the, but the one before that, we received three. So it's really dependent on what the minister is after at the point in time. We make our business cases to ensure that we cover all, all scenarios. So, you know, we'll put in an addition, we'll put in a growth school, we'll put in... Um, uh, a program, big program renewal, anything that sort of attracts the attention to try to be successful to get a priority. Um, it's always different how many priorities are submitted. Uh, typically it has been 10, the last one was five um, and they were weird. It was put in two brand new ones and resubmit three, prioritize again, you're a 10 for three. So it's always odd. Um, Usually I'm working on priorities right now and I always say to Kim, I don't want to come to pick. I'm busy. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get lots of money. Um, no call yet. And we don't even know if we're receiving a call. So it's, you know, one day I go into work and, you know, my next two months are planned out for me. So that's, that's the unfortunate part of not having a constant rotation, but we do our best and we try to receive um, money. I think we have hit like $280 million in capital. So we've received a lot and we're building a lot, um, but we are growing. So here's the um, priority overview. So I just showed it again and you can click on it to go in. Um, and it's the whole progression, as I said. And I guess I had to, uh, my superintendent made sure I had to say that we are not we do not receive all our priorities that we submit. We wish we did, but we don't. I made these story maps in hopes that, you know, we would be the most uh, uh, colorful board <laughs> to try to receive their attention to get more money. But <laughs> we'll see if that works. So uh, as you can be aware of, like, as Simcoe County's demographics change and alter, we're constantly seeing um, our enrollment change. So as I said, I've been with the board a long time um, and things 
have changed, right? Like if you just look at Bradford, at one point in time, we would get, you know, 0.25 kids out of a school for eight, out of a house for the schools. So, you know, we had so many schools allotted to that population. And as demographics started to change, we were receiving actually two families were living in a house or different dynamics were happening in these communities. Uh, the affordability of houses went up. So we're starting to see, you know, cousins move into each other to afford a house in their large homes. So they're, you know, two families going into a house. So the demographics have been altering and they've literally be coming from the south up. So now we're starting to see exactly the same trends that we saw five years ago in Bradford, which we were, you know, somewhat shocked at because it had been the same for like 30 years, right? New, sub new subdivision garnered exactly the same number of kids. So that has been altering. And now we're seeing the same demographic switch into Barry. Um, one of the demographics that we truly are not sure of what's happening is all of the condominiums that are, that are being built. So we're starting to see the towers in Bradford uh, and in Barrie. So when I say towers, we're talking 40 stories. So that is very new to our area. So, you know, we um, reach out to our sister boards to find out, you know, what kind of students are coming from these? Like, are they young professionals? Are there, you know, people in their older years that are moving to these types of condos? So that we have a flavor so we can sort of predict what is happening with something that is very new. Um, with the GO train getting more sophisticated coming up, will that alter who's coming and living in those areas? So there, there are areas that we like are monitoring twice a year to see how students are changing in these, these communities. So as a result of that, all those changes, that's when we start planning our attendance area reviews, our program reviews and our accommodation reviews. So this year in this accommodation plan, we've uh, called for two attendance boundary reviews. So they will be starting somewhat in the fall uh, by board policy. We have to have the report to board by March 31st uh, for an implementation for September for the elementary and it's two year implementation for the secondary. Uh, and secondary, we typically um, don't start with saying, oh, all the grade 11 is gonna move out. We kind of ride them through so that really there's uh, no students that are affected and they can graduate through their secondary careers. So the attendance boundaries that we are undertaking will be cold water, March lot, and then of course the, the associated secondary feeders, and then Aurelia and Twin Lakes. So those are the attendance boundaries we'll be undertaking this year. And these are the planning studies that are currently in progress. So we're kind of sitting, waiting. So we have Nottawasaga Pines, Banting, Bear, and the associated feeder schools. So we're waiting as uh, Banting works through its uh, replacement to call to actually do that work. Birchview Dunes, Worsley, and the new Wasega Beach. So, so the new Wasega Beach has been tendered and we're waiting for approval from the ministry to let us start digging. So as soon as we start digging, we will actually start that attendance boundary up. So that's coming very soon. Um, and the Baxter Port Zoo is actually now completed um, and it will be implemented in September. So that's why we've left it here. And then we have a couple of program reviews. So it's the Guthrie Forest Hill WR and new Oro. So once again, Oro Mendante is just getting ready to tender. So as soon as we have approvals from the ministry, we will start that up. Um, Allendale Heights, the second act Warnica, that's been complete and implemented in September. And then the French immersion feeders, uh, we've actually finished that since then. So once again, I have a nice little hyperlink on this page. And so these are our holding areas. So holding areas um, have been around for our board probably about four years. And basically what it is, is it's very large subdivisions that are coming in that just don't have a new school yet, right? We're still waiting for the ministry to give us approval or the schools under, you know, just approved under construction and all the kids have to go somewhere. They just don't go to that one little school that's closest to them. So we're talking like a thousand units. We're getting 300, 400 kids out of these units as they're being built. They can't all go to say Portage View. Right. So what we do is we break them up and we put them into other schools. So in the Hewitt's Creek secondary plan, so that's the whole south end of Barrie, we have nine schools that are holding for that growth. 
There's 7,000 building permits that have been issued. Um, so it's a lot of kids that are coming. Uh, we've warned everybody under the sun. We don't have a new school coming. We have not been approved a new school. So they're going to have to sit in Allendale, Sickinac, Mapleview, Hyde, Hewitts. Um, and then on the other side for Salem, it's the same thing. They'll be at Trillium, Holly, WC, and Allendale. So like they're they're not they're they're people are a little upset because they're not in their community, but they will be eventually. But that takes time. So um, we have open attendance boundaries and we have closed attendance boundaries. So unfortunately, we are at 108% in the elementary panel. And so most of our schools are full. We have limits on those sites due to maybe septic system, due to the amount of portables we can put on, or just due to the whole geography of the school. So we only have a very few schools that are opened out of area, and these are them. And so super timing when they get a request in to say, I'd like to go to Agila, they would process that and go, yes, Agila is an open school, you may attend. Um, but this list is dwindling fast, Agila, and Tecumseh South has had 700 units approved of which 600 have building permits for. So it'll be the first time ever in my history of the board that Agila and Tech South will be full. So like things are, are changing everywhere. This is our enrollment and utilization. And so as you can see, the red line is how many seats we have in our system. And the blue line is how many children are not in seats and are in portables. So you can see incrementally, we are increasing both elementary, secondary, we're you know cruising along just at capacity. And as the elementary school kids get bigger, they'll feed into the secondary and we will grow. I would say that these are very conservative parts because you know growth in Simcoe has been um, steady, but what would happen say in Vaughan is a subdivision of 2000 units would be approved and they're built out in like four years. In Simcoe, 2000 units would be built out say in seven to 10. So the, you know, they are slower to build out, but that trend is, is flipping and we haven't quite switched over our projection models yet because we're testing the water. Um, and over COVID, every single rural area has exceeded any expectation that we've seen in the last 15 years. So times are changing. So this is a beautiful, you can go into uh, this school profile, you can click on it and it will tell you exactly you know, who your superintendent is. It, is there a child care in there? Is there a before and after school care in there? How big is the school? So, you know, little facts, the address of the school, and then it will draw into the maps. We'll actually show people where the schools are. This is the enrollment piece. So as I said, we're, you know, over capacity everywhere. This little tool was built, it's called Insights. And it is, uh, if you're a data geek, like I am, this is a very amazing tool. So basically you can go in, click on it. And if you wanted to know the enrollment of Allendale, it's so you 10 years history. So it's a little line, just like my big ones back, just like these ones, but by school. And it will show you today's, and then it will show you the projections. And so when you get into the Barry schools, like I said, in Allendale, you know, she cruises along just below its attendance, like a, it's OTG. And then all of the feeder stuff is now going in there for holding and then just exponentially takes off. So there's reasons why those lines are there. It helps us predict, helps us actually find data errors. It's amazing when you kind of look at visually, you know, did your projections work out if there's some weirdness to them. Um, and it, 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 you can do it by family of schools. So it's a, it's a very fun tool. It's um, very exposing, I would say, right? Because this is our data that we use to make these decisions. Um, and it's helping us with developers. When they come in and we're saying, we want a school and they're like, prove it. We just go click, click, click five schools and say, uh, we have no seats. So we don't need to prove it. You need to give us a school. So it's very beneficial that way. Programming, this is a fun tool. Um, I especially like it from a parent's perspective. Uh, so you can go in and 
You can look at where the schools have different programming, where French immersion is, where your special education programs are by type of program. Um, and then in the secondary panel, it shows you what schools offer, which programming. So if you know we're in Barrie and your, your child was very much into hospitality, you can see which schools offered hospitality. And it has some pictures of what those programs look like. Because once again, um, from when I went to school, from what they what school looks like now, they're totally different. Like these are state-of-the-art um, rooms that are industry ready. And so when I went to school and did hairstyling and cosmetic, it was kind of like five sinks in the back. And, you know, you might have got some nail polish on the shelf. You go into a hospitality rooms today and they're fully outfitted as if you were the customer walking in and teaching the children exactly what industry standards would be. So it's kind of a celebration of, you know, the type of programming to get students different pathways. The facility one. Uh, it's basically a tool that helps us decide, you know, what schools are septic and well, because they make very big decisions for us in terms of uh, being able to, to uh, have enrollment. The year the school is open, uh, is the school accessible? And this is actually one of the, the tabs that was a little bit controversy when we first displayed it, um, because they're like, well, it shows that we don't have some schools that are accessible. And our response is, is that, we need to know where those schools are not accessible so that we can make a difference and go back and manage why they're not accessible and put um, capital projects towards them to make those buildings successful. So if that um, accessibility piece doesn't move, then we're not doing our job. If it's moving, which it has, it's actually amazing, then we're doing our job. So um, it's about being transparent to ensure that we do know that some of our areas are not accessible and we need to improve that. And that's it. And that's our presentation for the accommodation plan. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions from uh, Mike? Sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute there. Yeah, um, you'd mentioned like Wasega and the expansion of their gym. Uh, I know Sega has a huge population. They're pushing 700 people and they only have two bathrooms. What is like the school board's rules on that? If anything, because I know like in, I, I'm in food service and I've met a couple other people that have public washrooms and things like that. And I know our requirements are astronomically different when you talk about people per bathroom. Um, and especially, I mean, it came, became a bit more apparent during COVID when schools were taking their entire class to a bathroom simultaneously, like one at a time. So you'd take a, a classroom full of boys to the boys' bathroom and there'd be one stall and a couple of urinals. Um, so like, is there any plans to expand bathroom amenities and hand washing stations, things like that, when you keep adding portables and portables and portables and increasing student bodies, two or 300 to, to a building that wasn't built to hold those? So we are regulated uh, under the Ontario Building Code, and uh, we actually have schools that we cannot put any more portables on because we have reached the washroom capacity. So it's a it's a full ratio based on uh, male stalls, male urinals, female stalls, and gender neutral. Um, so it's purely calculated. So we cannot um, reach over that amount. Uh, we did do with COVID, there was some funding that was delivered and we went after bottle filling stations as well as hand washing stations. So some of our um, 1960s schools were some of the areas that we had to go in because they were corridors that just didn't have any facilities for hand washing or um, bottle filling stations in their in the corridors. They were strictly just the gang washrooms basically. Uh, so we did update any of those. Um, so all of our washrooms are fully conforms. Uh, and if uh, we can't go over every building permit we put in for a portable, I'm asked for a washroom count. So. Anybody else have any questions for Sandy? Uh, Richard. Hi, um, with, uh, with respect to uh, Midhurst on the Forest Hill uh, Forest Hill Public School. I know that uh, Forest Hill is 
more or less to capacity for uh, uh, because the addition of uh, portables and the septic system is running at capacity. So with the Gill Road uh, build on the east side of Gill Road in Midhurst with that underway, is, is there a plan to either expand or is there another school that's planned in the uh, in the area around Gill Road? Oops, I, I muted myself. Um, yeah, so we have a school site on both sides of the Midhurst secondary plan, one on Gill Road and one on Carson's Road. Uh, Carson's Road is the one that's coming uh, available to us sooner. That's where all the infrastructure is going. Um, you probably, you're from that area, I would assume. Yes. So uh, where the sales office is that they built, that is actually our school site. So we were kind of questioning why we have a sales office on the school site, because I'm pretty sure it will make a pretty good elementary school. Um, but that's that's its location. Uh, so that area right now is holding. So right now we've allocated to West Bayfield. Um, but they're pumping through that like crazy. They're registering. They're trying to register another thousand units over there. So I'm most likely going to have to break that up into a couple schools for holding. Um, it is on our capital priority list. So when you go into that priority mapping, there's three tabs. The current ones, the ones that we've um, highlighted to the trustees that we are interested in making a capital submission to. And then it got so big that we have another tab that says next in line. And so those kind of all change. And um, we actually met with the ministry and, you know, we've said Barry is now higher on the list. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, 7,000 units have been built since the time you asked me last time, which was a year and a half ago. So they move right, based on, on our need. So definitely Carson Road, Midhurst is something we're watching. We're hoping the new Oro Medante school is going to alleviate, but I like what it's going to do is it's going to alleviate for, you know, a nanosecond. And then all those houses are going to come in and then I'm going to put the portables back on Forest Hill. So, um, you know, we're just behind. Would that mean that the uh, students in the area would be shuttled to this uh, school? over in the Carson area in the meantime until the Gill Road School would be done? Yeah, Gill Road, um, that's the subdivision that we have our school site hasn't risen, like the developers kind of silent. So we've actually submitted to them to the municipality because there's a, a large company from Toronto has bought up some of the development and they're ready to go. So we've actually put in and said, we don't like the site because we're not you know, we're in phase 20, we want to be in phase one. So, you know, we're starting to like um, having to reprioritize even where our sites are based on, it's all development driven, right? So if you get a sleepy developer and that's happened to where your school site is, it's not good. So we've been kind of pushing back um, with these more rural municipalities to say we're full. Like if you're, you're asking for all this development, we need to be in, in to build our schools. Appreciate but that. I don't, Thank you. I don't. I don't know about shuttle. Like we still like uh, that side of um, Meters is scheduled to go to Terry Fox, so I really don't want to put the east side to Terry because um, it, it has space at the moment. Well, Barry's like undergoing its transition up there, but you know, I, they haven't started. I don't see houses yet, so I'm not ready to make that <laughs> that call back to the trustees. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Natasha. Hello. Hi. Oh, good. Sorry. I'm always the one that seems to be having connection issues. Um, okay. uh, Sandy, I thank you for sharing all that information. I just wanted to mention quickly, and hopefully we can um, dialogue after, but I didn't want the meeting to go by and, and no one addressed it, but I just had noticed that you used the term grandfathered. Um, and also when you were talking about the people's uh, in Bradford, um, you'd use the term othering, and I, I don't think any any harm was meant by that, but I, I appreciate off that was offering. the event. Yeah. Off offering. No, oh, we were talking about the demographics of Bradford and how, uh, how some of the families, the, the different living dynamics. So I just, I know that these meetings get, I think, um, you know, 
placed on the YouTube site and I, I don't want it to go by and not be addressed in case folks are watching, watching and, and thinking no one said anything about those harmful terms. So maybe it's something we can dialogue about after I'm, I'm more than willing to chat with you about it and just kind of go over kind of what is problematic about those, but I didn't want this moment to pass by and, and not kind of talk about it and bring it up in the moment. Sure. Um, we would have to, I think we would have to look at some of those policies because I think that is actually in the policy. Right. So maybe we need to update those policies, <laughs> but I, I, it's one of those, one of those ones where, um, you know, it, it, we're, it's harmful, right? It, it, the, the context and the history of where it came from, um, it is something that is, uh, sorry, my little ones here, but yes, if we can chat after, I really appreciate that. No worries. Yep. Great. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, Mike again. Sorry, I just have one more follow-up to the bathroom question. I just Googled the Ontario building code and it says for a school, it needs to be one bathroom and wash closet or wash stand per 20 pupils. Is that correct? Is that what you guys work off of? No, it's by gender. It's um, specifically gender um, specifics. So it's, uh, don't I think it's 28 for the female washroom and 26 for the guys. So it's an average, but we actually go in by like the building code specifically goes in urinals, water closet, male water closets, female water closets. Okay, so if it was, if a school has 700 kids, if say the average was in between those two, that should be 25 toilets for 700 yes. kids? Yes. Okay. And what does the school do if they're nowhere near that number and have that number? We, we wouldn't get a building permit, Mike, for the portables. So we, like there's no, like in order to get, unless there's, unless we have no, um, so like how a portable gets issued to a school is based on the staffing model, which is primary class sizes, right? So that's the whole ratio for the school. So as soon as uh, a staffing is allotted because of the population, then a portable gets issued. And if the um, if we've reached its maximum capacity, we've already tried to figure out all of the difficulties with the population. Uh, and done an attendance boundary. So for instance, Marchmont is a great example. We have reached its maximum capacity of, of portables for the septic and for the washrooms. And so now we were very uncertain as to whether or not if more population is gonna come to that area that we are calling an attendance area review and moving students from that area to another school. So we, we already try like to do a lot of back work to make sure that uh, we're not surprised that student populations are hitting our ceilings, basically either for washroom counts or for portable, actual physical location for portables. Okay. I'm still a little confused, but okay. <laughs> Is there another better way to explain it? Um, so, so sorry, the, the populations of the portables don't count towards the school yes. quota? No, it totally does. But when I go and ask for a building, I have to have a building permit for every single portable. So basically, yeah. under the code, we have to provide the student population and the number uh -huh. of fixtures we have in the building. And if it meets the code with that new portable, we get issuance of, a, of the permit. If it does not, we don't get issuance of the building permit. Okay. And it's like a lot of our... Um, it's, a, it's our new schools actually that are the ones that have the limitations on population compared to the older schools. The older schools had a lot of extra uh, washroom facilities in them, but the new schools are have been built with specifically 12 portables. So it's almost to the fixture count, you know, plus one toilet, but it, that's not enough to make any changes. So uh, it's the new schools because of the funding formula, we can just shrink the buildings and, and washrooms are some of the areas that uh, the ministry has shrunk on us, um, but they still meet the full ratios of the building code. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Just gonna check to make sure there's no more hands up.
Also wanted to mention, Sandy, that I'm also um, a University of Waterloo alum and also um, Bachelors of Environmental Studies, Urban and Regional Planning. <laughs> there you go. I just so, thought that was interesting. Did you go into planning or did you? I went, I went before you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, great. So we're going to move on to our items for um, decision. So at this time, um, I'm hoping everybody has had a chance to look over the future uh, meeting dates for next year. So at this time, I'm looking for a motion to approve the following dates for virtual PIC meetings for next year. All meetings will continue to be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And I've got Tuesday, September 26, 2023, Thursday, October 26, 2023. That will be our connections night. Um, Tuesday, November 21st, 2023, Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024, Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, possible uh, connections 2.0. And then Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. Can I please have um, a mover and a seconder for this decision? Uh, I got Tony and Richard. Um, so thank you, Tony, for your motion to approve. And thank you, Richard, for seconding that motion to approve. So the motion to approve the 2023-2024 PIC meeting dates has been carried. Um, so now um, next section we're going on to is items for information. Um, first, uh, PIC members and PIC member updates. Um, so we'll be holding a barbecue for the end of the year, again this year. It will be on June 20th at 6 p.m. at the Education Center, and we're hoping that everyone can make it. Um, and I know I'm excited. I hope everyone else is because we don't always get a chance to meet up in person, so this will be fun. And then are there any updates from any school councils? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Um, so we'll move on to um, item two, which is trustees. I'm going to ask one of the trustees if they would like to bring forward uh, an overview from the board. You want to go? Oh. I can. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so basically for May and June, I think we've been doing a lot of celebrating. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I know the uh, just had the 50th anniversary up in Aurelia, one of our schools. Um, we just OS STF had a um, awards last week that we attended. Um, there are some character awards this week, and I think in two more weeks that are being hosted at the board. And we are gearing up for um, our graduation nights, which I'm looking forward to. Okay, great, thank you very much, Trustee Connors. Um, so next would be staff um, information, um, principal updates. Sorry, Lisa. Sorry, um, Trustee, no, that's okay. Trustee Grummet, I just thought maybe you had something or are you okay to? Um, sorry, I, did, I actually did wanna just add one little thing, sorry. Um, the invite came up around the Safe Talk training um, I think Kim, you shared that, correct? Um, just I, I've I've been part of a Safe Talk training before, and I've I just want to share it's an amazing opportunity. If you want to learn more about um, having conversations around mental health, it's a great opportunity, and I think that's happening May twenty fourth in Ang in Angus. So um, take a look at that if you're able to attend. It's very worth your time. So that's all I wanted to add. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, that sounds great. That Safe Talk. Um, Susan, did you have anything you wanted to um, 
do the superintendent's updates or the principal updates? Sorry, I threw you off. Yeah, we're, the next one is administrator updates, uh, administrator, sorry, and Bray wasn't able to make it, but Jody is here. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, for our principal update on the elementary panel, we just wanted to update that we have our summer learning programs are out now. Uh, we've got a program for reading readiness for our grade one to three students, enhance your English, which we're calling I for our MLL learners in grade four to eight, as well as SIA um, uh, programming. So anyone with specialized equipment amounts, so any technology, they can come in for some summer training. And we have our STEAM program with a heavy focus in mathematics this year for our grade four to eight students. All of these are being offered as an in-person option and a virtual option, which is nice for families to be able to choose. There's also, um, since Bray's not here, I'll mention there's the grade nine to 10 credit recovery summer program for students who were struggling to get some of their credits. So they'll have the opportunity to recover those credits this summer. Uh, the other part of my update I wanted to touch on was I just wanted to say that we're continuing to see a lot of sports and arts around the board. Uh, quite a few schools have finished uh, or have upcoming plays that are being presented this spring, which has been really nice to see. Um, I know some of them have even done dinner theater uh, with their performances, as well as we've uh, incorporated a big tournament for rugby this year, which is new in our elementary panel. And we've got baseball coming up and track and field, which will be run. And we will have our board wide um, track and field once our students complete their in school portion. So it's really nice to see all that back, which we've talked about before, but I want to highlight it because it's definitely something that families are talking about. And we're seeing a lot of families out at our school watching some of these events take place. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so then I guess we'll move on to Susan for the uh, superintendent updates. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Trustee Connors just stole my thunder about character education nights. So uh, we are excited to welcome back character education nights um, where we recognize students, staff and volunteers. The celebration will be held at the board office for areas D, E and F on May 18th and areas A, B and C on May 30th. Um, we anticipate that evening um, to be well attended. Uh, the first night, we have about 230 individuals um, who have RSVP'd, so it's very exciting um, to see everybody and, and recognize their achievements. Um, and on the second night, uh, we will have 180 individuals and their families who uh, will also be coming, so it is going to be an exciting night. Um, before uh, I move on to the next section, um, the character education nights that we have now will wrap up our 10 character attributes. We will be embarking on new uh, character attributes, and there is a video that uh, I would like to play for you uh, to introduce uh, the new character attributes to you. Over the last two decades, Commit to Character attributes have been deeply embedded into the culture of Simcoe County District School Board Schools. These 10 attributes are taught and modeled as our commitment to a system-wide character education initiative. Recognizing that families and communities have changed over the last 20 years, we held a stakeholder consultation in February 2023. The data received from students, parents, guardians, and staff was analyzed to determine and update the character education attributes in alignment with the seven grandfather teachings. Our students and staff are proud and excited to share the revised character education attributes. These attributes celebrate the whole individual, reflecting all voices, and acknowledge the continued learning of Indigenous ways of knowing, the seven grandfather teachings, and the SCDSB strategic priorities. Character education to me is kindness. Honesty. Empathy. Caring. Character education to me is helpfulness. Inclusiveness. Integrity. Responsibility. Courage. Character education to me is compassion. Love. Sharing. Optimism. Character education to me is perseverance. Listening. Cooperation. Bravery. Character education to me is loyalty. Humility. Character education to me is wisdom. Respect. Truth. Trustworthiness. 
This artwork, created by Georgian Bay District Secondary School student Tasia Botno, was inspired by the Seven Grandfather teachings and features the Simcoe County District School Board's character attributes throughout the design. The Simcoe County District School Board is looking forward to launching the character education New Beginnings attributes early in the 2023-2024 school year. Okay, so that will be the launch of our character attributes for the following um, year. We intend to uh, provide information and learning to schools through the first 23 days of character education now, as opposed to the first 20 days, um, which we normally do. So it is an exciting time. We're celebrating um, all the attributes that make for a good human being. And uh, we look forward to seeing um, everybody um, really delve into the learning um, that is uh, part of what makes a good human. Um, also, in my updates, um, outdoor education, we are excited um, and planning for grade two, grade four, and grade seven programs for the next school year. Um, currently, the board office um, uh, the education uh, center, um, there is a large area where we are looking at, um, uh, you know, surveying the land and seeing how we can equip that land to support outdoor education at the ed center. Um, there has been consultation with the Indigenous Department around the land and usage of the land. Um, at the secondary level, we will be offering wilderness first aid um, in order to be able to run outdoor trips and, again, looking at staffing for the next school year um, around outdoor education to support that. Okay, better, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to social media highlights. Uh, Jamie, if you could. Hello. Hi. Absolutely, so this is the portion where we kind of go through a little summary of the meeting that we'll share through the board's Facebook and Twitter accounts. So if you're on social media, we ask that you check it out later and give it a share uh, with your followers as well. So for this meeting, I have the SCDSB's Parent Involvement Committee met tonight. Here are some highlights from the meeting. Number one, presentations were received from the Simcoe County Student Transportation Consortium, Mental Health Resources for Families, and the SCDSB's 23-24 accommodation plan. Number two, the committee reviewed meeting dates for the 23-24 school year. And number three, school council chairs are asked to check their school council email account for a new update from your PIC representative in the coming days. The next PIC meeting will take place on June 20th, 2023. Learn more about the Parent Involvement Committee with a link to the page on the board website. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, so, let me just, yeah. At this time, um, we have no correspondence brought forward for tonight's meeting. Um, are there any other matters from any members of the committee? Just going to do a look around and see if there's any hands up. I see none. Um, okay, so are there any notices for the next meeting? Okay, so since there's none, with there being none, we'll move to motion to adjourn. So do I have a mover and a seconder to motion to adjourn? So I have Tony um, as a... Um, thank you, Tony, for moving, and thank you, Sarah, for seconding. So next meeting will be June 20th at the Education Center. I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone there. And thank I would just you like to much. say before we end, I'm sorry. sorry, I just wanted to add, yes, so we will be having the barbecue, and I'll send out more information closer to the date so everyone can um hopefully put it in their calendars and join us because it was great last year 